Okay, I think we're good to go. Okay, thank you, Melanie. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our research roundtable, the Diet, Sustainability, and Gut Microbiome. My name is Meng Shi Du. I am a PhD candidate in the Nutrition, Epidemiology, and Data Science program. So it is a really great pleasure to serve as a moderator for this session. A few quick logistics before we start. So please note this session is being recorded for potential publishing on our symposium website. Please modify your name or turn off your video if you don't wish to be recorded. So we ask that all attendees keep their audio off and unless prom prompted during the Q&A Q session. So during the presentations, you can enter your questions or comments in the chat box or the Q&A boxes anytime. We will be finishing the session at around 2.50 p.m. to give a short break before the next session. So today we have invited Dr. Jennifer Lee and Dr. Nancy Zhao to discuss their research work on gut microbiome. So Dr. Lee is a scientist who as a human nutrition research, research center on aging and a research assistant professor in medicine at Tufts University. She completed her PhD at the UC Davis in nutritional biology, followed by postdoc training at the University of Toronto and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. Um, her research focuses on understanding how diet and nutrition can be leveraged to improve gut microbiome function, the gut health and the host metabolism in cell-based and the rotten models of dietary obesity and aging. Dr. Zhao is a research assistant professor in the Department of Public Health and the Community Medicine at Tufts School of Medicine. She is also an alumnus at Tufts. Her research uses omics data to ad identify and validate data-driven biomarkers that can be modulated for chronic disease intervention and are used for chronic disease risk stratification. She is also interested in developing novel strategies for translating omics knowledge and uh, biomarkers into public health, health programs, as well, as well as the disease prevention interventions at the population level. So their presentations today will highlight the effects of different diets on gut microbiome function, the mechanisms by which these diet micro, microbial interactions contribute to health outcomes and the methodology of analyzing microbiome data. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Meng Shi, for that kind introduction. Let me just share my screen. Can everyone see it clearly? Yes? Yes. Great. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you to the TNDS organizers for the invitation to speak in today's um, session. I'm really excited to share my work, um, which is focused on uh, how nutrition and the gut microbiome interact and help to contribute to regulating host metabolism and hope that it can contribute to some vibrant discussions at the end of today's panel. So I'm gonna give first a higher level um, background um, for those in the audience who may be new um, or not as familiar to obesity and aging and the microbiome. So what I'm showing you here is a heat map um, from the World Health Organization showing the prevalence of global obesity. And I wanna take a moment here to really um, highlight a few points in that especially obesity is a chronic relapsing disease and with more than 40% of the world population um, being overweight or having obesity, there are clearly insufficient strategies to help people maintain body weight over their life course. And um, this is especially um, important um, because obesity is a precursor of comorbidity for other metabolic diseases, including insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. And with obesity having tripled in the last 50 years, we really need to identify better strategies to help um, support people's uh, long-term health. And when we look at um, these statistics stateside, um, more than 40% of the U.S. adult um, population is overweight or has obesity. And it is clear that there are certain races and ethnicities that are uh, disproportionately affected. 
similarly, when we look at the prevalence of, or the heat map of um, aging, um, also from the World Health Organization, uh, what I want to highlight to everyone here is that the world is getting older. By 2050, um, the population of people over the age of 60 will nearly double from 12 to 22%. And with that really comes a lot of challenges that we may or may not be ready to um, address as a system, especially in the US where um, there will be a shift in disease burden and with that comes a lot of medical care costs. So what the HNRCA um, and others are really focused on in the aging sphere is to how to improve health span, which is defined as the number of years lived and health free of disease. And that's really important to distinguish from lifespan, which is a biological construct defined as the maximum number year of years lived. And this is important because, um, especially if we were to look at it in a sex specific manner, um, aging females uh, live longer than males, but they live a uh, significant uh, increased number of years in disability. So we really have to identify ways to help support healthy aging. And it's a combination of genetics, lifestyle, and environment that all contribute to how not just aging occurs, um, but also with obesity. So with these parallels in mind, um, Scientists have identified, this is more in the sphere of geroscience, that there are nine hallmark tenets uh, or traits that happen on the molecular level that contribute to aging. And this includes stem cell exhaustion, cellular senescence, and impaired nutrient sensing at the cellular level. And dysregulation of these, uh, any one or a combination of these processes contributes to age-related pathologies and conditions. And many of those are also um, in parallel seen in obesity. And uh, beneficial interventions that can help offset or prevent um, all of these processes are a combination of genetics, uh, medication and exercise, exercise and in terms of lifestyle, it's diet and nutrition and um, how it may be uh, interacting with the gut microbiome, which will be um, the focus of today's talk and also the research program in my lab. And um, a little bit more background on the microbiome now um, is that seminal studies have shown that there are um, major signatures in the gut microbiome that can distinguish a healthy versus a unhealthy um, person. So in this case, the proportion of formicutes um, versus bacteroidetes is uh, different when uh, someone is obese. And if they were put on a diet intervention and lost weight, you can see that the proportion of quote unquote healthier um, gut microbial species from the bacteroides um, uh, composition increases and you get a reduction in formicutes. And that is uh, restored towards levels compared to lean controls. This similar pattern is seen in mice that are uh, fed a high fat diet um, compared to a chow or natural or uh, lower fat diet. And in terms of causation, um, what uh, the grandfather leader of uh, establishing a role for the microbiome and metabolism, uh, Jeff Gordon's group, showed that when they did fecal microbiota transplantation, taking feces from an obese human into uh, recipient germ-free mice, they found that the obesity phenotype was uh, uh, transmitted um, by FMT through the microbiome showing causation. And uh, interest in the microbiome to aging has really increased over the last decade. And um, that is what um, myself and others at the HNRCA are really focused on now. So what distinguishes, um, or what are common features of a uh, dysbiotic gut microbiome or um, gut health? Um, there are many overlapping signatures in obesity and in aging. Um, this includes when you put mice on a high fat diet um, or they are older um, conventional mice, there's an increase in gut permeability. That means the gut is leakier, um, pro-inflammatory molecules such as lipopolysaccharide, which is shed from um, gut microbial species, are able to cross the gut barrier and enter into circulation to cause low-grade inflammation. 
And we also get reductions in um, gut hormones, including glucagon-like peptide one, which is uh, a critical hormone that regulates um, energy um, balance and glucose metabolism in mice and in humans. So ways to leverage the gut microbiome um, to improve host metabolism include changing your diet, um, increasing the uh, levels of prebiotics such as fiber in the diet to improve host metabolism, or we can do a gross manipulation of the gut microbiome uh, by way of fecal microbiota transplantation using germ-free mice, or we can do probiotic supplementation. Um, so you're giving a single microbial strain or a consortium of microbial strains in an effort to shift uh, microbial function in the host. And all of these mechanisms kind of overlap, some and not all, um, to increase gut peptide secretion and fortify the gut barrier. And this leads to um, the next section where I'll show some data uh, or research in my group um, prior to joining the HNRCA and um, the research program that we're actively building now in the lab. And the overall goal is really to identify ways that we can leverage diet and the gut microbiome to improve host metabolism throughout the lifespan in mice. Um, so this small story that I'm uh, going to share with you um, focuses on work that I'm completing and had uh, initiated while I was at Harvard, where we had identified in my mentors group, a novel group of anti-diabetic lipids called palmitic acid hydroxysteric acids that were identified to be increased in circulation from a mouse that had an, an, an obesity phenotype. And despite them, the mice being more overweight, these high levels of lipids made them very glucose tolerant, meaning they had better glucose metabolism, and they were more insulin sensitive. And um, studies in collaboration with uh, another group in Sweden found that pasta levels in people that were healthy were higher, and in people that were insulin resistant had lower levels of these pastas. So my question was whether um, pastas in conventional, so that means a mouse that has a normal um, gut microbiome and unmanipulated from wax labs had um, any effect on the gut microbiome um, and to identify potential species that may be contributing to the PASA effects to improve insulin sensitivity in mice. So what I did was um, treat these normal mice with PASAs or vehicles, so our control, and I collected the terminal feces and um, uh, went on to look at the contribution of the microbiome in this phenotype being that when you just treat mice with these lipids for as early as 13 days, we see an improvement in insulin sensitivity. And this is important to note because these mice are fed a chow diet, which means that they're generally healthy. And if you give these pauses and they get a further improvement, um, that was what um, led me to ask if there was something dynamic happening in the gut microbiome which is responsive to diet that may be contributing to this improvement. So um, taking feces from those uh, mice from the previous slide, I performed fecal microbiota transplantation into germ-free mice that were fed a high fat diet. And similar to the previous phenotype where there is no effect of PASA treatment on body weight, we get this improvement in glucose tolerance. So what we're looking at is an excursion a uh, glucose excursion in response to glucose, where um, in black is the control mouse uh, receiving feces from a vehicle treated normal mouse. So that is their glucose excursion. And when, um, compared to a mouse that received PASA FMT, we get a lower uh, glucose excursion curve. And similarly, we also see an improvement in insulin sensitivity. Um, so this was really exciting to us demonstrating that there is something bioactive in the gut microbiome that may be transmitted in response to and may contribute to the positive effects to improve host metabolism. So taking that same sample um, from or that same fecal sample from those insulin sensitive mice, we did um, metagenome sequencing and identified 
Bacteroides theta iodomicron, which is a microbial species in positrated mice, to be most variable and strongly associated to improved insulin sensitivity. So in our next studies, we went on to supplement mice that were fed a high fat diet, so they are more glucose intolerant, and we metabolically phenotyped them over a number of months. Um, and they were supplemented with either PVS serving as our control, heat killed B theta as another control or live B theta, so live probiotic. And what we went on to find was that there was an interesting sex specific response to B theta treatment um, over the course of our intervention. Um, and what we saw that female mice gained less weight had lower adiposity, so less fat mass, and were more glucose tolerant compared to controls. And these benefits of B-theta on host metabolism were not seen in males. So this indicated that there was a sex-specific response to B-theta um, in dietary obese mice. And we've since gone on to identify a mechanism involving the gut mucosa and intestinal epithelium um, to support these um, metabolic benefits um, at the whole body systemic level. And now changing gears, um, showing you guys a little bit of what my lab is interested in in terms of diet and the microbiome is um, this new um, area of work that I'm establishing at the HNRCA. So for those who are doing basic studies, we are very familiar with the concept that mice are fed a quote unquote standard chow diet. And that is typically a composition of cereal or other grain based um, rodent diets. Um, and we typically assume that there is a uh, set standard of macro and micronutrients that make up this composition. Um, but what is not commonly um, highlighted or um, brought to an investigator's attention is the wide variability of non-nutrient ingredients that include phytoestrogens, heavy metals, endotoxins, my, mito, um, and pesticides. And these uh, levels of macro and micronutrients are further altered in response to diet treatments such as irradiation or autoclaving so that they're compatible with specific um, barrier facilities. Um, and so in a sense, a lot of basic studies are not just studying whatever their intervention of interest or treatment interest is, but they're really studying potentially a confounding factor of rodent standard diet that is different between not just across institutes and labs, but maybe also different within their cohorts when they're studying one group of mice in like one season and then they buy a new bag of diet and then it's a slightly different composition which may have different effects on the gut microbiome and host metabolism. So that's really a major issue that um, I'm really passionate uh, about uh, understanding better. And all of these uh, differences in just a standard based diet are further um, exacerbated or um, more difficult to study when we are looking at perhaps, for example, another diet that I commonly use is a high fat diet. And when we look at the big picture and step out of um, like what we're doing with the mice, this is, we're studying mice fed a diet that is the same diet for the course of their life. So in an aging study, someone, including my lab, may be putting mice on the same diet for from week eight of life to week um, 100 of life, which is really in far contrast to what humans eat, which is super diverse on a daily basis, on an intermeal um, uh, basis. So um, these are some common things that we overlook in rodent studies, and that's what um, we're hoping to investigate further here. So if we were to look at a mouse across its life course, um, the dietary components um, in a potential standard shower include omega fatty acids, um, minerals, and other um, micronutrients and heavy metals that we aren't even considering because the commercial vendors that sell these diets don't even list it in their dietary nutrition composition. And when you look at how long we're studying these things in mice, it may have 
cumulative effects um, in the context of aging and contribute to host function and phenotype. And this, again, has effects on mechanisms including cellular senescence, um, immune responses, um, different uh, aspects or different forms of microbiomes across the body and the metabolome. So these four outcomes are um, molecular or are mechanisms that my lab um, typically uses to complement our uh, rodent studies. And in some, like these can be translated and have translated to humans across the life scale, but many of those unknowns have been really focused on um, developmental biology and like midlife um, uh, translation. And there are much more unknowns about how these diets work or translate to um, people at you know, the later uh, stages of life. So I guess the take home message from today's presentation is that um, we are very excited to further understand the molecular underpinnings and identify beneficial interactions between diet and the gut microbiome that can be leveraged to improve our health span. Um, and I hope that this gave you both a high level and a more um, granular level of what we're doing in the lab. And with that, I'll do a quick shout out that as I establish my lab, I'm really actively looking to recruit students and postdoctoral fellows. So if there's anyone in the audience um, in today's uh, session today that is interested, please feel free to shoot me an email. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to um, the panel discussion at the end. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for the great presentation. So from your talk, I think we have learned the gut microbiome plays a really important role in the uh, improving the host and metabolism. Um, in your example, you use a rodent model. And, uh, and now I think we, uh, let's switch gears. I think that Dr. Zhao will share her research experience in the better use of omics data to leverage the gut microbiome for human health. Um, now, Dr. Zhao, it's your turn. You can share your screen. Thank you. Thanks, Mengxi. Um, really grateful for the high level intro that Dr. Lee gave, and um, I would I would like to add um, the case of type two diabetes as another example. Um, let's see. Hopefully, this is all looking great. Um, so we um, I won't go into the specific details, but. A lot of us know that there's already a lot of compelling evidence um, to showing that the altered gut microbiota is clearly associated with the development of type 2 diabetes. And also, we know that dietary intervention can modulate gut microbiota and then consequently impact host phenotype. Um, and so the example I've shown on the screen here is a randomized clinical trial that was done by my collaborators. And um, there are a lot of studies, dietary intervention studies done out there um, to date. And um, another thing that we are also aware of is most diabetes data sets today are analyzed using the taxon-based approach. And studies have reported on a variety of bacterial taxa to be uh, associated with type 2 diabetes. However, if you quickly just scan across the summary table, you'll see that uh, we have not, there's no single taxon that's consistently reported across published studies. And we will also find opposite association of the same taxonomic unit reported in different data sets. So this brings in problems if we want to identify the bacterial members that are specific and key to this causal relationship between gut microbiota and metabolic risk. So what I want to do today is to use um, diabetes 
as an example um, to, and to provide some of my thoughts from the perspective of data analysis um, and how to use data analysis to better leverage gut microbiome for human health. Um, one, uh, so the one theme of my research is to constantly advocate for analytical methods that treat the gut microbiome as a complex ecosystem. And to do that, um, we I insist on methods that are reference-free and guild-based. Um, so a little different from some of the other um, conventional methods that we use for data analysis. So in order to explain what I mean by reference-free and guild-based, um, I would give a quick intro on a typical taxon-based analysis that um, a lot of us run. So here on the screen here, um, I am showing an example of a pancreatic cancer data set that I've analyzed using the taxon-based approach. So from the very top, you will see that right after processing the sequencing data, um, I have over th 6,000 bacterial variables for um, 125 samples. So this is why we often talk about microbiome data being high dimensional and highly sparse. Um, so in order to get ready for more downstream analysis, we have to reduce we have to reduce dimensionality and reduce sparsity. So in a taxon-based approach, what we will do is we'll take all the bacterial variables and then compare them to an existing database and annotate a taxonomic position at a certain level for each of the bacterial variable. So because this data set was tissue microbiome, um, I was not able to find taxonomic annotation for 22% of the bacterial variables at the genus level. So in order to move on, I will have to drop those 22% of bacterial variables from my data set. So at this point, I'm making the assumption that sequences not included in existing databases are not important and could be excluded from further analysis. So at this point, I have a, a little, about 4,600. Um, and then the next thing would be taking all of these variables that could be annotated at the genus level and then aggregate them into different genera. So now I have 24 genera for 125 samples. So I have significantly reduced the dimensionality of my data set from over 6,000 variables to 24 variables, right? And then we can investigate the association between these 24 variables and host phenotype. However, at this point, um, I am making the assumption that bacterial members belonging to the same taxonomic unit have the exact same relationship with the host phenotype. Um, so this is, um, so to understand what I mean by reference free, um, what I'm talking about is to actually not use any existing database to annotate um, a, a data set. Um, so, so I do not want to give up on the 22% of bacterial variables simply because they cannot be found in a data set, uh, in a database. Um, and by, by guild-based, what I'm talking about is the idea that instead of grouping bacterial variables into taxonomic units, um, could we group them into coherent functional groups? Because in an ecosystem, members from very different species actually work together as a coherent functional group, uh, or we also we can call it a guild. And when they belong to the same guild, they often exhibit co-abundant behavior. So bacteria members of the same guild could be coming from very different taxonomic positions, but they somehow they somehow tend to work together. So, so um, using an example of um, that you can see here. So this is one of the very first data sets that I've worked on uh, using this kind of method, um, and then what this clinical trial showed that 
gut, my gut bacteria responds to high fiber diet as guilt and not as taxa. So in the plot um, on the left, every circle here represents a unique bacterial genome. And we detected the co-abundance patterns um, between these bacterial genomes and then found that these 161 genomes can be clustered into 18 potential guilds. And the when when the genomes belong into the same gill, so if they're in the same gill, they're given the same color, um, they often increase or decrease in abundance together. And the red lines in between the gills um, denote co-occurrence pattern between gills, and the blue lines denote co-exclusion pattern. So we then, um, the heat map on the right shows correlation between these potential guilds and disease phenotypes. And you can see that we were able to find three guilds that showed negative correlation with disease phenotypes, um, nine, and nine guilds showed positive correlations, while six guilds actually show no correlation with disease phenotype. Um, and another important lesson I've learned is that the response to high fiber diet was actually strain specific. So here in these two panels, I've tracked the um, abundance change of five bacterial strains during the intervention period. They, the all five bacterial strains belong to the same species. So they all belong to the same taxonomy taxonomic unit. And if we use the text the taxon based analysis to analyze them, we will collapse these five lines in the uh, in panel A into one um, one variable and it's represented by the black line here in panel B. Um, however, if we look closely at panel A, we'll realize that um, there's actually three different patterns of abundance change um, among these five strains. And by using guild-based analysis, we would cluster them into three guild variables in panel B. And the three lines in panel B um, represents these three different abundance change patterns, and they produce a more accurate representation of strain level microbiome response rather than averaging out the response at the species level, right? So the important lesson, so this uh, work has given me a different sort of a different perspective on the gut microbiome, realizing that um, the basic building blocks of the gut microbiome are bacterial genomes, are individual genomes, and individual genomes from different taxonomic backgrounds could work together to form coherent functional groups. And as a group, they could thrive and decline together and be associated with different disease parameters. So moving forward, I would like to highlight a recent and ongoing analysis um, that we use. And in this analysis, we're using the, this approach to study the eco, ecological structure of gut microbiota. So the data set comes from a randomized control trial of clinically diagnosed type 2 diabetes patients. The, the, in, Individuals in the intervention group uh, received a high fiber diet for three months, and then the diet was taken away from them, and everybody also completed a one year follow up. And we collected data from baseline at three months right after the at the end of the intervention and at 15 months at the end of the follow up. Um, so nor the control group just received usual care, and then they were they also completed a one year follow up. Um, and if we take a quick look at the cl uh, clinical results, we'll see that during the three month high fiber intervention, um, if you look at the panel in the middle here, so the intervention group is represented by the blue dot. 
Um, and month zero represents baseline. And then month three is end of intervention. Month 15 is end of follow-up. So you will see, you can see that the gut microbiota shifted away from con the control space, upper right corner. Um, and the and hemoglobin A1C significantly reduced. One year after the high fiber intervention stopped, gut microbiota reverted to no difference with the control, and the disease also came back. So, using guilt based analysis, we ended up identifying 141 genomes that are stable responders to the diet. And we also found these 141 genomes um, are represented by the little dots in the graph on the left here. Um, we found these genomes that could be clustered into two guilds. And they were um, and they were only negative correlations between the two gills, indicating a competitive relationship between these two groups of bacteria. And interestingly, gill one, represented here by green dots, increased in abundance from baseline to end of intervention, and then decreased again from end of intervention to end of follow up, while gill two showed an opposite changing pattern. And so the animation here on the screen is suggesting th this idea that these two guilds somehow formed and acted as a seesaw-like structure. And we also observe significant association of these 141 genomes and 42 host bioclinical parameters. So the question is, this pattern that we are observing, is it unique to this data set or specific to this diet that we used for this RCT, or could it be validated in other cohorts? So we first tested if this kind of a structure existed in an independent case control um, type 2 diabetes study. So the idea is to use our 141 genomes as reference and retrieve the abundance variation of these genomes in a different data set. Um, and you can see that we found this similar network structure in both cases and controls. And the pan panels B and C on the right here shows that we use those 141 genomes as variables and use the machine learning model to show that there is a moderate prediction power to classify diabetes cases versus controls in this data set. So this is suggesting that maybe the, 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 this core microbiome that we uh, detected using um, cons constituting of these 141 genomes are maybe not transient and not diet specific. So we you know further have we have further done validations in data sets of other diseases. So using the same strategy, um, here you will see three different uh, data sets and um, diseases. So in each of the data set, they had uh, cases versus controls. And we were able to use the 141 genomes in these separate data set to uh, find excellent to outstanding prediction power to classify case versus control. And also, in addition, um, we are interested in whether this pattern that we found is unique to the Chinese population, or it could also be identified in other diseases and, and data sets across different ethnicity and geography. So here you'll see yeah, here you will find the machine learning prediction model results for a variety of data sets. And based on the 141 genomes, we find moderate to excellent power to classify case versus control in all these data sets. So a little sneak peek into this recent study. Um, but what 
what I find interesting is really to identify the specific bacterial members that are key to this causal association between gut microbiota and host metabolic health, because it will really uh, be able to allow us to use those specific bacterial members as targets for health recovery and health maintenance, and also use it to monitor response to healthy diet, um, and also potentially um, identify susceptible individuals for early targeted intervention. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share. I would would like to acknowledge all the amazing colleagues who worked on this very complicated data set and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. Very impressive and a very insightful presentation. And uh, I feel like uh, it, it's so great to have both of you here. Your presentation sounds like very complementary with each other and uh, provide us with a kind of very complete picture of gut microbiome research from rodent models to human clinical trials and then from the wildlife to data analysis. Thank you so much. Um, now I will open the floor to the uh, audience. So let me check the Q&A section to see. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and then uh, or raise your hand. We can call you to ask questions or you can also type in your question into the chat box or the Q&A uh, feature. Yes, um, Heather, uh, Heather Miller. You can... I, I don't... I don't have any questions. Um, I'm still processing all of this information. It both presentations were extremely fascinating, and I'm really looking forward to um, digging a little deeper into the research that you both are doing and uh, seeing what comes next. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks for your kind comment and feedback, Heather. All right, we have the uh, first question here. So uh, I think Rachel uh, Chitham asked, can, uh, Dr. Zhao, can you speak more to the gills or functional groups in relation to uh, dietary patterns, especially as to macronutrients composition of the diet? Thank you. So super great question. Um, so in, in terms of macronutrients, carbohydrates, fat, and protein, uh, so my quick answer is, I don't know much about fat and protein at all. Um, uh, so most of the uh, interventions I've worked on are very much focused on fiber. Um, and I would, you know, we're really hoping to expand into the other universe of macronutrients. Um, but in terms of fiber, what we um, what's really interesting is that fiber brings in it when we introduce a lot we find that when we introduce a lot of fiber into the intervention diet it really um, stirred up the ecosystem it brings in a lot of environmental perturbation for the gut bacteria and as this you know as the environment dramatically changes for the gut bacteria population, we do find um, certain group of bacteria having very stable relationship with each other. Um, so we are finding that when some, you know, when we when we first use co-abundance pattern to identify any potential guilds, but out of all the potential guilds, some guild structure are quite transient um, versus other guild structures are very stable across um, time point and across um, levels of fiber being introduced. And thank you. And I would love to learn more about um, protein and fat, hopefully one day. Um, so I saw Melissa, you, you, you said you also have a question. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, both of your presentations were wonderful and it's a very complex, um, difficult conversation to have. So you did fantastic. 
So uh, we ran a study on 18 to 28 year olds that we felt did not have disease. And so my question is, as far as the guild analysis approach, have you done this on non-disease populations to look at the, the change in the gut microbiota over um, dietary patterns? And it's very similar to Rachel's question to some degree, because we randomized them and we only had 36 into the three different focused dietary guidelines, looking at carbs, proteins, and fats but these were supposedly healthy young adults. Um, and we saw a pretty significant change in um, when we taught them how to grocery shop, taught them how to eat and took them through an eight week intervention. We did definitely see a change over three different intakes of fecal matter and blood, and blood um, samples. So I guess um, like, I don't know how far along you feel you want to venture into non-disease specific samples, but that is what I guess I'm curious about because we have this data set and the goal was more behavioral change, but we ended up doing some of this um, mixed methodology and did some anthropometrics obviously. And we were just really trying to um, dabble a bit in uh, point of care blood testing as well as fecal samples in humans. Yeah, that is, that sounds super interesting. It's definitely a world I would love to venture into. Um, and I, I guess that's my short answer is I would love to analyze a data set like this. And um, I it, it could bring in a different perspective looking at the gut microbiome change. Um, the only struggle is um, typically, um, sometimes it does require a certain number of samples for the co-abundance analysis to work. Um, so, uh, so that's something that I worry about when I um, offer to analyze somebody else's data set. And, but that is definitely something that that I'm a direction I'm hoping to get into because right now the a lot of the high fiber diet intervention studies I work on are very much controlled. Um, but if we would like to actually, you know, do knowledge translation for the next step, we we'll, um, want to um, figure out ways how to implement a more relaxed setting with more support uh, strategies and um, and also ideally, you know, track gut micro biome change. And it's definitely something that we'll love to do. All right. Thank you. Um, we, we have like two minutes left and I wonder if the audience have any other questions. Hi, this is Heather again. I do have one other question. I wonder if um, any of the, the studies take into consideration the impacts of different uh, medications that these diseased patients are using. So I think the question is for Nessie, yeah. Um, I... Do you mind re do you mind reiterating your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I assume that when we're studying diseased populations, that many of them are being treated with various uh, pharmacological interventions. So, are we um, are we accounting for those in our results analysis? So, for the example that I showed, the um, in in the example that I just showed, the two groups were having identical um, medical treatments. Um, and so everything that they were experiencing were the same. And the only difference was one being offered the um, yeah, so one being offered the one being offered the high uh, fiber diet. And also um, we also find 
this when we um, you know, reanalyze other people's data set um, uh, to do um, have to do a certain technical adjustment to make sure that the microbiome composition comparison is fair um, and uh, medical um, and medicine use is definitely one thing being considered at that stage. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes, that's great. And I'm really happy to hear. I, I love the approach that you take um, in organizing these, the, in the groupings. This is really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for everyone. Um, given the way we are at the time for, for, for the end. And also, uh, I hope uh, Dr. Zhao and Dr. Li Yongman, if the audience have any questions, they can email you or contact you for further questions or uh, research collaboration in the future. And uh, yeah, thank you again, everyone, for your participation. And uh, I hope you have a great weekend.